All right, so let's get to Travis Rudolph and this trial, okay? It is an ex-NFL player, ex-Florida State wide receiver, um, and the gist of this case is he has a girlfriend. Um, he, he basically, injuries cause him to get out of the league, not really make a lot of money. He has a girlfriend. They get in a fight. She makes fun of him for being broke. He has a girl on the side. It's not really his girlfriend, he says, but he has a girl on the side. She finds out about it, gets mad. There's a ring camera video of him, of her uh, beating on him, punching him, whatever, hitting him with stuff. Um, and then she either texts or says something that somebody's going to come F him up and may, may or may not have said somebody's going to come and end his life, basically. Then, a few minutes later, four guys show up, uh, his girlfriend's brother and three of his friends, show up at his front door. A lot of it's caught on the ring camera. Turns into a fist fight with Travis Rudolph and his brother. They're kind of getting beat up. Whether or not the guys that come up to the door have firearms is part of what's going on in this trial and what we're trying to determine. It seems confirmed there was at least one of them that had a gun. Travis Rudolph goes inside, comes out with the gun, starts shooting, and somebody dies. So he's charged. He uh, pleads not guilty, says it was self-defense, and that is kind of the trial. So a lot of you have been saying the trial's crazy. I've watched parts of it. There's been some very uncooperative witnesses. The judge has seemed annoyed with the whole process. To me, it's gone a long time for a trial like this. They usually go a little bit quicker. Um, but we are going to, I'm going to show you a TikTok video that's like two minutes long that gives us kind of a gist of the case. And then we're going to jump into specifically his testimony today. So let's start out with this TikTok video here. Nine one one calls for help flood into dispatch around midnight. Things escalated so quickly. For the first time, Travis Rudolph talks about the night he says <coughs> four men showed up at his front door. I just heard just a loud bang, as if like the police was at the door. In exclusive video, we can now see everything playing out on security cameras. This all happened within seconds, so my brother was the first one to get to the door, so I was worried about his safety as well. Ooh. Travis, 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 Travis. According to court records, Rudolph and his then girlfriend Dominique Jones got into a fight earlier that night. Open this door, bro, because it got me. Dominique, stop! Who are you calling it, bro? Afterwards, she texted her brother Keyshawn Jones. Evidence shows they both made threats towards Rudolph. As soon as I came out, so it said, "Please go shoot his." That's what the text says to her brother. I literally, Tyler, like, he sucker punched me to my left eye. It was Tyler and Sebastian. It was, like, kind of trying to corner me in. And um, Tyler, he had pulled out his firearm. And during that time, Tyler pulled out his firearm. Sebastian was like, you messed with the wrong girl. You're going to die tonight. And then that's when I went back inside and grabbed my firearm. The fight spilling out into the street. The video shows Rudolph then running off his property with an AR-15. I had to do what I had to do, you know what I'm saying, to protect me and my family. My brother was on the ground getting jumped by two of those guys getting kicked. So that's the reason why I went down the street. While they're all in their car, I see two firearms pointing at me and my brother. And I, like, I couldn't believe it. It's just, it just a, a split decision where I just felt like it's, it's either... Me or, or and my brother or these guys that's, you know what I'm saying, going to get hurt. Rudolph firing 39 rounds, the four men speeding off. I know people at home are going to question, okay, he, he has an AR-15 and he fired. All right, we're going to get into that question that she asked. And I am going to summarize uh, some of his testimony, but then I'm also going to kind of summarize after we hear his explanation the best arguments for the state, the best arguments for the defense. And John, if you could create a poll that says, based on whatever you've seen in the trial or your limited knowledge here of what you're getting, was this self-defense, yes or no, but wait to put it up. Because I want to give arguments from both sides before anybody makes their decision. So, Pokey, we're going to answer that question. We're going to answer a lot of questions. So if you guys have questions about this case, now is the time. A ton of you asked me to do this, um, said there wasn't enough people talking about this. You had a lot of questions. So go ahead and ask questions. We're going to star them, and then I'll answer them after we kind of break down his testimony. 
Let me pull it up here. All right. So let me kind of get us caught up to where we're going to watch. Um, so there was some argument basically about whether or not he and this girl were dating, whether they were together, whether they were just hanging out, what's the verbiage, whatever. They were together, whether they were exclusive or not. Um, he was talking to another girl. She got mad. They FaceTime this other girl. Um, she gets more mad. And then Travis Rudolph does say to her something of the effect, you're just mad because that other girl looks better than you. Her body's better than you. Something like that. Something that everybody would basically find despicable and brutal and annoying. Not worth getting killed over, right? But um, he does admit saying something like that. And I guess this girl, his current girlfriend, just had surgery of some sort, cosmetic surgery. So it was like even worse, I guess, whatever. Um, something like that. He said something disrespectful to her. She punches him, hits him with a trophy, whatever. So he, they go outside the house. She tries to come back in. His brother's there, locks the door. His mom is there as well. It's his mom's house. Um, his brother unlocks the door, lets Travis in, but not her. That's when she says, you know, I'm going to F you up or kill you or whatever. And text her brother, go shoot him up. Uh, then she left. Sister calls Travis Rudolph and says, hey, the girlfriend, Dominique, called. She said she's sending her brother there. I'm really worried. Then he starts describing the incident. The four guys come up. His brother comes out of the house. That's the guy in the white shirt you saw in the ring doorbell camera. He goes out. The guys start beating him up. So Travis runs out there. Um, very weirdly, the prosecutor's like, you were extra aggressive because you had your shirt off. He was like, it was late at night. I was going to bed. That's why I had my shirt off. I don't, I don't know. Whatever. Um, and his lawyer, I thought was kind of weird. He's like, just cause you're in the NFL doesn't mean you know how to fight. Right? Like very weird kind of like they're dancing around certain issues. It feels like it's like, I don't really care who you are. Four guys come to your house to jump you. And at least one of them has a gun. Like that's not a good situation. I don't care who you are. Uh, I don't care if you're Chuck Norris. So he says he gets sucker punched in the face. He thought they were trying to kill them. And that's the first, you know, really important part of this. He, he thought they were trying to kill him. Um, him and his brother, you know, it wasn't a fair fight. He saw one of them had a handgun at that point. Um, then the weird stuff starts happening. And I will say, I think Travis Rudolph overall did a really great job. This is very difficult to testify on your own behalf. We've talked about this a million times. I think a couple times, um, he smirked when he shouldn't have, especially talking about the relationship and things like that. But overall, I thought he was very clear. He was very intelligent in how he spoke and explained um, exactly what happened. He did not go back. He did not get tricked. He did not get tripped up during cross. He had his version of the events. He stuck to his version of the events. He was specific enough. He didn't know every little detail, but he was specific enough to where I think the jury could have believed him. And, and this is what it's all going to come down to. Did the jury believe Travis Rudolph? The other witnesses in the case, you know, the, the other dudes that showed up besides the one that was shot and his girlfriend, they were like, you can believe what they said, but they were not likable. Nobody's going to really push for them. This is a case where maybe it's an imperfect victim that they're not, you know, pushing as hard for or feeling as bad at, as, especially because Rudolph does testify that that, I think it was that guy or at least one to so two people of the four had guns. Like you show up to a guy's house, two of you bring guns, it's not a good situation. That's a bad decision. Not that anybody deserves to die ever um, for this stuff, but like that's a bad decision. You're putting yourself in that decision. It's no comparison with the Idaho four victims. Um, uh, okay. So to, to catch us up to where he's at, he sees the guys beating him and then the weird stuff starts happening. They run away. Okay. And I think his brother runs after them is, is basically what he says. And so he think he sees them 200 feet away beating up his brother. He runs in the house now because he's seen they have weapons and he grabs an AR. He has a handgun in his, you know, underwear drawer basically, but instead he goes in his closet in his bag and grabs his AR. And that's the first piece of this that really starts to make this decision more difficult for the jury. Um he did this is in Florida and he tried the stand your ground defense had the stand your ground hearing. We knew he was going to testify because there was already statements that he made in the stand your ground hearing. And, um, and lost because the court basically found that he 
was chasing after the victims. The victims tried to retreat and he went after them. And that's where it kind of comes to this situation. And that's the part we're going to watch together. I'm going to hit a few questions first. Uh, Sarah Bellum. Hi, friends. My sister is traveling to Clearwater, Florida tomorrow for work. I was so excited. I said, oh, I know someone there. <laughs> Lawyer, you know, fam keeps it 100. That's awesome. Weather's nice and hot. Uh, Diamonds and doggies. Regarding the Rudolph case, I noticed some of the time when the attorneys were called to the judge's area, he went up with his lawyer. I've never seen that before. Yes, they are allowed to. Defendants can. He's not cuffed um, while he's there. He even stepped down from the stand while he was testifying and pointed out some things right next to the state attorney. So, yeah. Tori, isn't self-defense when they're in their house, not outside running away? So, no, it's not just in their house. You can have your self-defense anywhere. Um, and Tori again asked, what is the actual verbiage of the self-defense statute? You have to be in reasonable fear of serious bodily harm or death. And if you remember back to the popcorn shooting case, I was also in Florida. Basically, they have to be able to kill you, that you, you have a reasonable fear that they are going to seriously hurt you or kill you, and you can respond with deathly force, with deadly force. Um, if it's just somebody, you know, throwing a stick at you, you could argue potentially you could die from that. I've seen lawyers argue that that's, you know, serious bodily harm could be coming your way, but that's different. But if somebody pulls a gun on you, which you will hear that is part of this testimony, there's no doubt that you are reasonable to fear the bodily harm. And that's not where the question comes in. We will get to where the question actually comes in. Um, Nicole, I haven't followed this case. What are the charges is first degree killing. I'll say to try to try to keep away from the YouTube algorithm bumping it. Aaron, Peter, you need to watch the cross the lead detective. She lost the case. Why would I look for evidence? I don't know is there. Yes. So one of the things is because he testified that there were multiple people that had guns. They, the defense argued that there were guns here or there. They did find one that was admittedly, I think Tyler was the one that admitted on the stand that he did bring a gun, but there was another gun that Travis Rudolph said he saw. And the detectives just did not do a good job. A la Murdoch of even going and looking for it. I saw parts of it. It was not great, this de detective's testimony. But regardless of that, I really think most of these cases, uh, and Pokey said, I thought he charged them because they were beating on his brother. We're going to get to that. There's more on that later. Um, but that is what he said. Um, but let's hear him explain it. And as I said, I think these cases really come down to does the jury believe the, the party in the case or the defendant Travis Rudolph in this case. It's probably on two times speed. Let me bump it down. To, let's go 1.25. All right, here we go. It's like halfway in, halfway out type thing. Let me stop you. So the guy fighting with your brother, you know his name? Um, it was Sebastian and Chris Lowe. Okay, Sebastian with the high dreads like your mother described? Right. Where did he go? He went to the passenger seat. In the front or the back? Front. And how about Chris Lowe? He went to the driver back seat. And those are the two guys fighting with your brother? Right. And... So you get there, does this happen in a split second or are yes, you standing there for 10, 15 seconds yeah, watching this? Yes, jurors. This all happened within a matter of seconds, like literally seconds. Yes, jurors. So he's speaking directly to the jurors. I did not think it was weird, but he is he's pretty polished. Like he's a smart guy. So you see the guy get in the front passenger seat. You say Chris Lowe gets in behind the driver in the back seat. Right. And do you see this guy without the shirt with the tattoos? Yes. What's he doing? Um, he gets to the car. And um, like I said, during this time... At what side of the car is he got? The driver's side. Front or back? Um, back. What does he do? Um, he had the door, like, half... It was open still, so it's, it was as if he was, like, using it as a shield or something. Right. And like I said, I couldn't tell if he was in or out, halfway in, halfway out. And uh, You don't know? I don't know. What do you see? Um, at that time, as soon as I got down there, it appeared that the car was heading towards me, and the, and the lights was off. And I seen Sebastian point the firearm through the front windshield. And Tyler was pointing the fire on through the door frame of the door, the back door. So he sees not one, but two firearms pointed at him and his brother. And if we remember back from the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, his explanation of what firearms were pointed where, I think eventually carried the day and that the jury felt, especially with the victim's testimony that basically when he moved the, the firearm towards Kyle Rittenhouse, he had kind of admitted that on the stand. And that's really important because there's no doubt in the, the uh, popcorn shooting case, pretty wild that, you know, throwing a phone, could a phone have been a weapon? Could that be deadly force? That was much more arguable factually speaking. And that's why they got into his age and, you know, whether he was frail and whatever. But in this case, 
Rudolph's testimony is two firearms pointed at him and his brother. And yes, why did he run? So why did his brother run down there? We don't know. But why did Travis Rudolph run down there? Because he saw his brother getting beat up and he went to help his brother. That's his story. He saw the firearms. That's why he responded like that. Sure. How far are you and your brother from this car at this point? Uh, I'll say about 10 yards away. Further or closer than you and me are? Um, probably a little further. Close to it. Sorry? Probably a little further. Just... Yes, this is his lawyer. Sorry if I didn't make that clear. This is direct. A little bit. Tell me stop. About right there. Yeah, approximately. So when, when that happens, <clears throat> you see the car coming towards you a little bit? Yes. And you see, you know it's Tyler at that point with a gun? Yes. And where is he pointing the gun? With the door frame of the back door. Like it was open, so I mean, yeah. So SFLO music, that is the difference. And again, the videos do a big difference in all of these cases. They make a huge difference. Um, but he is explaining it in a way that it was explained in Rittenhouse. I agree, people probably would not have believed um Rittenhouse if it wasn't for the videos. The I don't know how to really explain it, but if it was the door frame open, yeah. it'll be right in the middle of it. I think. Over the top of the door frame? Yes. Okay. We heard Keyshawn testify over and over about the gun wasn't past his face. How could he pass his face? Could it be past his face if he's in the back? Sustained. Well, <clears throat> was the gun past Keyshawn's face? No. Okay. Did you clearly see a gun pointed at you? Most definitely yours, yes. Where was your brother at that point? He was to the right of me, and I believe he was behind me, though. How much I'm, behind you do you think? I would say yeah. probably five yards, maybe. Were you focused on your brother? No, I wasn't focused on my brother. I was focused on our lives, though. Most definitely. Did you start shooting before you saw Tyler with a gun? No. Did you see anyone else with a gun? And again, this is a very important sequence. When did you pull the trigger? Why? Did you pull it before you saw the gun or after? And he answers them all perfectly for the self-defense law. And yes, somebody also said protection of family is legit. Yes, self-defense, you can be in your shoes or somebody else's shoes. So it can be himself and his brother. At that point, he was going to help his brother, but where there were two guns pointed at both of them, you know, it's yourself and a family member, Claudia. Why did he choose his AR? He says because it was the closest one to him. Now you, I, I, he argued a little bit on cross about this, but to me, it's like there were four dudes there against just my brother or maybe two of us. Two of them had weapons. So I'm not just going to pull one handgun against two handguns. If I'm going to protect myself and my brother, I got to bring more firepower. Like, I think that would have been a, an okay explanation, but he did not want to go there. Yes, Sebastian. And where was his gun? It was pointing through the front windshield. And Sebastian is the one that passed, ultimately. So he did have a firearm. And where was it pointed at? It was pointing in me and my brother's direction. Did you give him a chance to shoot you? No. You know if either one of them took a shot off? No, I don't know. Not to my knowledge. Why did you shoot first? Because, I mean, if, if I wait for them to shoot, that's the, that's the matter of seconds. And it could be me and my brother's life just gone like that. Did you feel that your brother's life was in danger of uh, of being taken away? Most definitely. Not only my brother, mine, as well, too. Any doubt about that in your mind? No doubt. Did you want to shoot anyone? No, I didn't. Um, did you At the time right after the shooting, did you know how many times you shot? No, I didn't know. Did you just keep shooting until you felt you and your brother were safe? Sustained. So how long did you keep shooting? I kept shooting. They objected to leading there. He leads him like throughout the entirety of his direct examination. It's leading. Um, but again... And these are important questions, and I haven't given you these details yet if you haven't been watching the trial, but why did you keep shooting? Or he said, did you keep shooting until the threat was gone? He said yes. And then Travis Rudolph over and over and over again, doubles down, triples down. That is when he stopped shooting, when he felt the threat was neutralized. More on that later. And so I felt like there was no longer a threat. Were you trained to? Were you, you trained marksmen at all? No. You trained in law enforcement. So, this is an interesting uh, point here by Eliza. You shoot first because you don't want or because you want to live. Correct. And I don't think I think the the state is not going to focus on whether or not he shot first, but it's what he did after those first few shots. And to know exactly how many shots or, or where the shots are going. No. Did you do your best that day. Yes. Save your life. Yes. Did you even know anyone got struck? No, I didn't know. 
We saw all those shots in the car. Why, why'd you do all those shots? Like I said, I kept shooting until I felt like these people were no longer a threat. Did you have to pull the trigger over and over? Yes. We heard how the gunshot sounded. Um, was that you doing that? Yes. And you maintain every shot you did was in self-defense? Most definitely. Of you and your brother? Yes. That's the other thing. It's all got to be self-defense. Sir. Did you see Tyler run away? Yes. Did you ever see him fall on the ground? Um, it looked like he stumbled. Did you ever Tyler see is one of the four guys that showed up to his house. He's one of the ones that also had a firearm. Did him come out of the car? Do you know if he was with the car or behind the car? Do you, do you have um, any idea? When the car was doing like a three-point turn, it looked like he was like behind it, like using it as shield type thing. So That's also important. The car was doing a three-point turn. And did you run and chase him and keep shooting at him? No, I did not. Did, did you see what your brother did? Um, yes. My brother like ran in the direction that he ran in. Does your brother have a firearm with him? No, he does not. have a firearm? No. Do you know why your brother did that? No, I have no clue. I think he's a lunatic for even doing that, to be honest with you. Did you chase this guy also and say you're going to finish him off and start shooting at him as he's running? No, not at all. Did, did you actually know that was Tyler running away at the time? Well, you didn't know his name, Tyler, but did you know it was the guy without the shirt? Yes. So after, after the shots, we see you on the video. Remember that video? Right. Why, why'd you go down the block? Well, because I had my, seen my brother run in that direction, so I was worried about his safety as well as just making sure that those other guys wasn't coming back. What did you do then? I mean, what did you do or what did you see when you went down the block? Uh, when I seen, what I seen was when I was going down the block, I saw that my brother was following him in his direction, Tyler in his direction, and I seen Tyler jump the gate. So I told my brother, Come back, he's gone now. You actually saw Tyler jump the gate? Yes. Shoot at him? No. Yeah. Because he wasn't a threat to me at that moment. So this, I think, is pretty huge. And again, I think this is good preparation by the attorneys as well, that he had other chances to finish off some of the other guys, especially Tyler, when they were on foot and they were leaving. And he didn't. So before we kind of end here, there's a couple minutes left of his testimony. I want to read... Um, I want to talk a little bit about what they do on cross. We're going to fin watch him finish this and may basically tell you what the two main arguments are for each side. Um, so on cross, she starts in on you were dating this girl and you basically cheated on her. Just try to make him look like a bad guy. And he, he argued with her. I would have been like, yes, I, I was unfaithful, which eventually he got impeached. And that's what he said. But like, that does not make you deserving of, what happened to him or what happened to the other guy. Um, it was a bit of a confusing cross overall, I thought. Um, and I thought Rudolph was a really good witness outside of a few smirks, like I said. Um, but one of the interesting points is she played the video from multiple angles and it did look like the car was driving away from him. And he said, no, that's a bad angle from another angle. I'm positive. It looks like it was coming towards me. And then she said, no, um, uh, it was going away from you. She shows him another angle. So like it was going away from you. So what's interesting is that he didn't ever say, but I'm thinking, and I'd probably argue it, even if the car was driving away from him, it doesn't mean they weren't pointing firearms out at he and his brother. So to me, I'm like, where the car was driving toward or away from him doesn't necessarily mean that there was no threat, no serious threat. But that was interesting. That was such a focus. And he argued with her. But if I'm the defense attorney doing closing, I'm focusing on it. It doesn't matter where the car was driving. You can point firearms in front of you, behind you, to the side of you, everywhere. Um, she handled the firearm sloppily. I don't know what's with prosecutors handling the firearm sloppily. The judge was like, can you just please put that down? Can you point the barrel towards me, not towards the jury? Um, some weird stuff like that. She made some points about why he picked the AR versus the, the handgun. And he didn't have good answers for it. Um you're free to screw whoever you want is something that she said, a quote. And I was like, you were a great, you want to take your shirt off to be extra aggressive. Like those were the kinds of things she was saying, which I thought was kind of weird. Um, but then the big points she started making was you kept shooting after the vehicle was gone. He shot. If I was going to tell you to guess how many times he shot, if you haven't been watching the trial, what would you guess? Just throw a number out there. He shot. 39 times and had a hundred uh, uh, bullet drum or whatever you call it that can that can hold a hundred bullets 
That's pretty wild. And I think if you're not a gun person, that would sound like a lot to you. And an AR may sound like a lot to you for anybody to have, um, especially to go pull it and fire off 39 shots. I think that is a lot. On redirect, they they hit, did you invite these guys there? Did you know what was going to happen? Um, you didn't know what she was doing. You didn't think that it was serious. He didn't think it was serious what she was doing or the threats that she was making. Turns out it was. So basically, the state's argument is, when the fight started, you brought a gun to a, f- a fist fight. When the fight started and you might lose, you weren't f- in fear of dying, you went in, you didn't grab your handgun, you grabbed your AR, you grabbed your 100-round drum, you chased after them when they already left, you shot at them as they drove away, and you didn't just shoot once or twice, you shot 39 times. That is not self-defense. That is way excessive force. That's the state's main argument. The defense's best argument is fight, fist fight, getting beat up, four on one, two of them had firearms. He went to protect his brother. When they pulled the firearms on him, him and his brother, regardless of where the car was going, they were a ser- in, in uh, danger of serious bodily harm or death. He fired as many shots as he needed to, to to neutralize the threat. He's positive that every single shot he fired was necessary. That's it. That's the main gist of the arguments. I have felt like of the witnesses I have watched, the defense's witnesses, his mom, his brother, and him have been way more credible than a lot of the detectives. And I mean, I don't know if we can, the victims, I guess, and his girlfriend. Um, so John, go ahead and post the poll now just about kind of where you guys are feeling. And I get it. We don't know all the evidence. If you haven't watched the trial, that's fine. I just want to, with, with that kind of summation of the facts, do you feel like it's self-defense or do you feel like it's excessive because of the ammo and the weapon and the amount of shots that were fired? So let me know that. Give your vote. Tell me what you think in um, the comments. And we're going to watch another two minutes, basically. His back towards me, everything. So, And you told your brother, come on? Yes. And what did you do after that? Uh, I walked back to the house. Did you try to the fire on somewhere and hiding it? No, I did not. Why not? Because I did everything in self-defense. I had every right to do what I did. I say- so this is interesting, right? And we talked about this. In was it Lori Vallow? We talked about this or no? Letitia Stock with the insanity defense and what you do after can really tell somebody, even if you think back to Theodore Edgecombe, what you do after is really important. And what did he do? Did he flee? Did he run? Did he try to disappear? Did he hide the weapon? Did he do all this? Now, I, and there was some argument that he put the weapon under the bed and the shells under the bed. Now, you could argue, and again, the state's going to argue he did try to hide them, and the jury's going to have to determine: Did he try? This is in Florida, uh, Barley Hops. Did he try to hide them by putting them under the bed? Because you'd be pretty stupid if you think that they're not going to walk into the house where all of this happened and look in your bedroom for your weapon and your bullets. AR shoots fast. Somebody said yes, and he says he had you know quick reflexes. He's an athlete. They blame some on that, but it's like. I don't really think you have to be an athlete to to pull the trigger fast, but I don't know. Um, But yeah, so what he did after to me is indicative of self-defense. To me, it makes me lean further towards self-defense. Me and my brother's life. Why don't you throw it on the roof of the neighbor's house so the police won't find it? I mean, I I just wouldn't do that. You think of doing that? No. How about pick up the shell casings and hide everything? Do you think about doing anything like that? No, not at all. What? So you walk home? Yes. Do you see anybody uh, besides the people we talked about? No. Did you even know Mr. Estes watched a part of this? No, I had no clue. Did you start hearing sirens at all? Yes, I'll say probably like two, three minutes later, I heard sirens. What did you hear? I heard sirens and I heard the helicopter. I think I've seen the helicopter light flashing down on the streets and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so did you stay outside or what did you do? No, we was inside. Me and my brother came back inside. You went in first? I went first. And when you went inside, where was your mom? Um, she was like in the like kitchen area, if I believe. What was she doing? Um, she was frantic, crying, okay. things like that. Anything? Yeah, I, I told her. I told my mom. I said, "Mom, I saved me and my brother's life. They was pointing guns at us." And were you emotional during this time, or were you just talking like this? No, I, I was definitely emotional. I was shooken up. Like, I mean, if you ever go through that type of experience, it's not a good feeling. Like, just knowing that, like, you just seen your life flash before your eyes. So, I was definitely emotional. And I think that's a good answer too. When you go through that, it's not a good experience. Life flashed before your eyes. So Sir Merrick, I think you're making a good point here of why we have juries of different people and why this chat is 
a group of people all across the board. Some people think a hundred round magazine is a lot. You don't think it's that many. He didn't even, well, you, you say 39 shots, not even that much. And there could be people on the jury that think the same thing. 39 shots, not even that much. He didn't have to reload. Didn't even empty half the magazine. Other people are going to be like, holy crap, 39 shots. That's a lot. And I think that's the point is you got to talk through that stuff. And what does it mean? And how important is it? Even if he would have fired a hundred rounds, if he thought two people were pointing guns at them, it's like dog eat dog at that point. Right. And you gotta, it's you or them. And that's kind of how his testimony went. And I think a lot of people can relate to that. I mean, I don't know. A lot of people would never know what they would do in that situation. Split second, whether it's Travis Rudolph, Kyle Rittenhouse, whatever it may be. It's very hard to think what you'd do. So, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. Lacey day. If I were a black man, I'm not leaving my gun out around the cops. And I'm certainly not holding it sitting, you know, on the front porch waiting for them to show up. And he explained that in a very respectful way, not a, you know, I hate cops way. He wasn't disrespectful to anybody in the way he explained it. He just said, I know people get shot. Cops shoot people all the time. You know, he even said like they pulled guns on me and I walked out with my hands backwards because it's a safety issue. They wanted to make sure I didn't have a gun. Like I thought he was a very, very, very compelling witness. I thought he... He handled cross impeccably. Um, I think he knows what he saw. He doubled and tripled down on what he saw. I thought he was a really, really, really compelling witness. And I actually thought the prosecutor came off more snarky than him. Sometimes, you know, lay people or, or criminal defendants can come off as snarky, um, but I don't think that he did. Thank you, Tina. All right, let's see the uh, results of the poll. So based on what you've learned about this case, was this self-defense? 85% say yes, 15% say no. So you all as the chat with your finger on the pulse, I don't know how many of you, let me know if you've been watching the trial. Just if you have been watching this trial, put a one in the chat. If you have not been watching this trial, put a two. I just want to kind of get a gauge um, as far as how many people from this chat have been following this trial. Because if you have an 85 you percent 85% of you think it's self-defense. I didn't get that. Whoops. Try again? Hello, Siri. I don't need you right now. Um, so I said one if you have been watching it, two if you have not. Uh, and it seems like more twos than one. So I'm not going to say you guys have your finger on the pulse like you usually do, but when you guys watch a full trial, usually your finger is right on the pulse of what the jury's thinking. Um, I would say it looks like about a third of the chat has been watching this trial. And again, the main title of this was Koberger. We are going to do a cutout and post this Travis uh, Rudolph video separately so that people that are just searching for that can find it as well. Um, some people are saying I'm going back and watching it all now. It is really interesting. All right, let's see what other questions we have. What recourse does he possibly have against the state aggressors if found not guilty? I have watched the trial and I think he'll be found not guilty, but in my opinion, state overcharged. So... No recourse against the state, um, especially it got past stand your ground. So the judge agreed that there was enough to go forward on just because you're not guilty doesn't mean you can sue the state for prosecuting you. Now, the aggressors, if if he wanted to, he could sue them for, um, you know, battery, uh, you know, whatever harm they caused him and damage they caused him. Probably not worth it at this point. Rebecca, again, Peter playing devil's advocate. Why did he run after them if they had already retreated? You're not playing devil's advocate. This is the state's case. He was, it was excessive force. They fought, he was losing. So he went and got not just any gun, but his AR. He chased after them, shot him, shot, didn't shoot him once, shot him 39 times. But his explanation is, and it seems like a lot of the testimony is adding up that his brother may have chased after them, but he was getting beat down again by two guys. So he was going to protect his brother. That's his story. That's how he explains it. That's what a jury has to determine if they believe or not. This is a prototypical factual dispute. Two people, two parties, two groups saying opposite things and the jury has to determine who they believe. Not unlike Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. So you're not playing as devil's advocate. That's exactly what the jury has to decide. So a few more ones are coming in. Some people have just seen clips one and a half. I like that. It sounds like a lawyer answer. It depends. Yeah, 
I'm, I'm, no, they're not deliberating yet, Tori. Closings are tomorrow, and then deliberations will start. Um, so we will probably talk verdict at some point this week. Spirit, I would, I would want to know how experienced he is shooting guns. If he has not that experience, 39 is a lot to me. So he has his carry concealed. He would shoot at the range, but he's not like a professional marksman. But he, he, it was a something that was practiced by him. It was not just it was not like his first time shooting a gun, and he owned multiple guns. Azam, thank you for the super sticker. Let's talk live. Peter, excellent work covering the Koberger case. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. All right. So we're going to call it um, for tonight. But thank you for everybody that came and, hang, and uh, hung out and talked about these two cases. Let me know what you think about Ethan Chapin's mom, her test or her uh, uh, statement and her interview that was given. And also what you think about this Travis Rudolph case. More coming this week. The times are going to be all over the place, so make sure you subscribe and hit that reminder bell if you haven't already, and hit the like button on the way out. Let's get to 3,000 likes before you guys sign out of here. I appreciate you all coming, hanging out, and we'll do more of it this week. Until next time, I am out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube, and don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok at Tragos Law is our handle. And don't forget to listen to the Lawyer You Know podcast featuring new episodes every week. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know.